So you want to learn how to make sourdough, huh? Don't worry, I was totally intimidated by it too. My aim here is to show you that it's actually super simple because if I can do it, you can too. Now, if you don't already have a sourdough starter, you'll have to Google that before I can help you. But if you do have a sourdough starter, the very first step of the bread making process is to feed it. I've found that a one to two to two ratio of starter water flour yields great results. That means if you have a quarter cup of starter, you should feed it half a cup of water and half a cup of flour, then mix it all together until it's the consistency of a thick sticky pancake batter. That's the most important thing to learn. If you know the consistency you're looking for, you won't have to measure it out every time you feed your starter. Once that starter is fed, you can set it aside to let it bubble and rise. I use a rubber band around the outside of the jar to keep track of where I started and where it's gone. Also, now is a good time to tell you that while it's important to cover your jar to keep the starter clean and protected, you should never, ever seal it. If you do, the gas inside the jar will build up and it'll escape the best way it knows how, which is exploding. For this reason, I prefer pickle jars to mason jars and it's why I've never had to clean up glass in my kitchen. Now it's been a couple of hours and we can see with the rubber band that our starter has doubled in size and is ready to use. Besides doubling or tripling in size, it's easy to tell if your starter is ready to use because if you shake it around like this, it'll be super bubbly inside. All right, let's make some bread. My recipe makes two medium-sized loaves or one pretty big one. I also almost always measure my ingredients by weight because it's a lot easier to stay precise when you measure in grams. And as we all know, baking is science, so it's important to stick to the numbers. To start, add 100 grams of sourdough starter to the bowl, then zero out the scale. Add about 300 grams of water to it. I say around because we'll definitely need more than that. At this stage, going over on water is not a big deal. Also, another easy way to tell if your starter is ready to use is if it floats around in the water like this. Good starter is full of air and floats to the top. All right, zero your scale again, and this time add 500 grams of all-purpose flour to the bowl. I've used Walmart flour, Costco flour, grocery store flour, it's all pretty much the same. So don't worry what you buy, it all makes bread. Now, before you mix your dough into a ball and ideally after you add the water, you should add two teaspoons of sea salt. I nearly forgot this step, but you won't. Trust me, one loaf of unsalted bread and you'll never forget again. Once you have all of your ingredients added, stir your dough until it's a scraggy mass. And that means messy and textured around the edges. You'll definitely need to add water, but do it a little bit at a time so the dough doesn't get too wet. You don't want to be stuck in that too much water, too much flour cycle, so be conservative and take it slow. Once your dough looks basically like this, cover it with plastic wrap or a wet towel and let it rest for an hour. After an hour, remove the covering and get your hands really wet. Wetting your hands allows you to touch the dough without getting too sticky. This next process is folding and stretching the dough, which involves picking up one side of the dough, stretching it, then folding it down over the center. Do this four times so you get the dough from each side and the whole thing is folded. Follow this process every half hour until you've done it five or six times. Folding and stretching not only mixes everything together, but actually helps to activate the gluten in the dough, which turns it into an actual workable dough ball. So it's super important. After you've stretched and folded your dough 24-ish times, your dough will look and feel a lot more like an actual dough ball. Now it's time for the bulk rise. Wet your hands and transfer your dough to a larger, clean bowl. Then cover it tightly with plastic wrap. Put it in a warm place and let it raise until it doubles or more in size. This can take anywhere from six to 12 hours. It really just depends on how warm the dough is while it raises. After it raises and you have that huge airy mass of dough, use wet hands or a silicone scraper to pull the dough out of the bowl and onto a floured work area. Well flour the top of your loaf, then you'll have the option to shape the entire mass of dough or cut it in half for two good sized loaves. I've opted to cut mine. Once you're ready to start working the dough, flour your hands and then pull the dough into a circular shape. Then you can begin to form your dough ball. This looks different from regular kneading. The idea here is to gently pull the sides of the dough down in a pinching motion between the back heel of your hand and the countertop. Gentle is key. If you pinch too much or too hard, the bottom of your dough will break through the top like this. And while it's not a big deal taste-wise, it's not as pretty. Once your first dough ball is formed, generously flour the top and do it again for your second dough ball, gently pinching the dough between your hand and the work area until you form a nice smooth top. Once you've made your two dough balls, you're ready to put them away to slow raise and ferment. There are a few ways to do this. One is to get a non-patterned kitchen towel and flour it generously on any surface that will be touching the dough ball. Then drop your dough smooth side down into the towel inside the bowl. This is important as it keeps the top of your dough shaped and pretty. 
Then wrap the towel around the dough and cover the whole thing tightly in plastic wrap. Getting this right will take practice. Dough is fickle and it will stick if it wants to. Another option is to skip the towel and just flour the top of your dough and the inside of your bowl. There's always a chance that the dough will stick, but it doesn't dirty as many dish towels and it keeps the dough wet and hydrated. Or if you really want to commit, bannetons are a perfect non-sticky solution. For this though, let's just worry about the mixing bowls. Now your dough is formed, sealed, and ready to put away. For the most delicious bread, you should let it sit in the refrigerator to sour and slow raise for around 36 hours. But any amount of time it spends in the fridge will add to the texture and flavor so overnight is fine too. After a day or so of resting your dough in the fridge, it's time to bake. The first thing to do is preheat your oven to 450 degrees. Then pull your dough out of the fridge. It'll need to warm up for about an hour before it's ready to bake. Next, put your Dutch oven with the lid on into your hot oven. You want both to be scorching hot before you place the sourdough inside for baking. Let that sit inside the hot oven while your dough warms up for about 45 minutes to an hour. Once it's warmed up and ready to bake, grab some parchment paper and free the bottom of your dough from the towel it's wrapped in. Place the parchment paper against the bottom of the exposed dough and flip the bowl upside down. Then slowly and carefully pull the dish towel off your dough ball. Ideally, it'll look like this, a nice little smooth round ball. If it doesn't come out smoothly and the dough tears, don't sweat it. It'll taste the same. Just keep practicing until you figure out which style works for you. The last step before baking is to score the dough. This will release pressure and steam while the bread bakes so it doesn't burst open or crack funny. You can use a razor, a lame, or just a sharp knife and cut any design you want into the dough ball. Just make sure there's at least one big long line so the pressure can easily release. Now pull your hot Dutch oven out of the oven and remove the lid with your hot pads. Be careful, this thing is insanely hot. Now grab the dough by the parchment paper and without touching anything, plop it right in the pot. Then cover with the lid and put it back in the oven. Keeping the lid on at first will help cook the inside of the bread, so set a timer for around 20 minutes. Once your timer goes off, remove the lid and let the bread continue to bake without it for another 20 minutes or so. When it's ready, the bread should be a beautiful golden brown. To remove it from the pot, just grab the sides of the parchment paper and slip it onto a cooling rack. Now listen, I know it's tempting, but don't cut into your bread for at least six hours. It needs that time to complete the cooking process. If you cut into it too early, it'll be gummy and wet and, well, still delicious, but not nearly as good as it would be if you waited. Just trust me. After that six hours, bust it open and it'll look like this. Absolutely wonderful. And that's it. Sourdough is simple, delicious, and all those sourdough cultures are really good for you. I make two loaves a week and it's such a fun hobby. Let me know how your bread turns out and remember, stay sweet.